wait upon the Lord in 40 days of fasting and prayer. Remember that um, when you read the Bible, and uh, whether Old Testament or New Testament, it looks like a lot of things happen very fast. And uh, it almost looked like, um, with the exception of Jesus' life, of course, where every day is like something new. Uh, and uh, that most of the Bible people have to go through a time of waiting, a time of prayer. And uh, some things between some events look like it just uh, yesterday or a day before. But actually, between some events uh, is a timeline of two years, three years. Like many of us don't realize that within the book of Acts chapter 9, three years were within that book. Uh, and between the time Paul left uh, Damascus and then he came back and uh, in Galatians 1, he clarified he actually spent three years before he met any of the apostles. And then, and then as far as John, the apostles' of vision, between the time that uh, God spoke uh, to uh, or planted the church in Ephesus and during the time when Paul was there, where the Ephesian church was planted in Acts chapter 19 and it grew until the whole city was affected and Paul was in the end, his time was up and he went on to his uh, fourth mission journey, not so much a mission journey as it was a journey in which he was taken to be on trial to Rome. It looks like uh, short times has passed by, but in some of those things, years passed by. Even in the book of uh, Acts chapter 28, which is the last uh, chapter, uh, you, you would notice uh, that uh, it, ends, uh, it ends with the Apostle Paul uh, finally uh, in a rented house, waiting to be on trial. And the Bible mentioned it's about two years. Between the last time that the Ephesian church was uh, flourishing, taking it to be, let's say, at one of the peak of Paul's ministry, uh, let's say it's about AD uh, 70s, to the time when John the Apostle receive a message for Ephesus was about in the 1890s. So roughly about 20 over years passed by uh, in the Bible. And uh, uh, sometimes you also notice it, sometimes in the movies, you know, things happen and then uh, a few years pass by just like that, but the movie cannot show the years because the movie is only about two hours long. And uh, uh, you always wonder, what did they do in between? How did they stay faithful to God? Uh, and so we are entering into this exciting time where we are only about one to two years away from dramatic things that are going to take place in this move and in the world. So stay strong in God, learn how to wait upon the Lord and how to wait patiently for the things of God that God spoke to come to pass, for they will surely come to pass. And we're talking about things that are going to take place in 2022-23, and then other things are going to take place in 2027 when the two fallen angels are released. And we need to continue to learn how to grow strong and wait upon the Lord, which is not an easy thing. Because waiting on the Lord requires that every day, day by day, you continue in a routine, in your discipline with God, and in waiting with God. And in my personal discipline, uh, I have always uh, uh, seek to spend at least four, sometimes five hours with God every day while waiting upon the Lord. So it is important that we learn to develop disciplines uh, in our life and diligence is the Bible word that in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 that uh, uh, those who diligently seek God, God rewards them, God blesses them. There is a place for diligence and patience. Patience to wait upon the Lord. And then some people just cannot sit still, you know. They just have to wait for something. When's the next, when next prayer walk? When's the next thing you're going to you know, bring us some, 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 some activity and all the things? Look, my friends, it is locked down. The world is in a lockdown. 
And it's uh, unless, of course, we transport ourselves in the spirit, which uh, is in, God has to be in God's perfect time and uh, flowing with the timing of God. The world is in lockdown and only essential travels can take place. It is a time in which God has driven His people to learn to spend their time on their knees. And during this lockdown, don't let your head get affected and don't fellowship with the wrong people and uh, fill your head with all kinds of wild things that, are, that, that will discourage you, that will cause you. When nothing is happening, you know what's happening? For the past year, uh, since we've been locked down, been spending at least about four hours with God on average per day and um, fasting and prayer two days a week and sometimes more and just waiting upon the Lord. What is happening? People just spending their time with God. And uh, so you, you must understand that uh, when the enemy comes and says, what this evil is happening, this is, what? You're talking about things that are half truth uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago. What's happening the past 5 years? We've been walking with God, growing with God, knowing God. So don't let the enemy affect your mind and your emotions during the time of waiting. It is a time where one should be disciplined enough to learn how to wait on God 3-4 hours a day since most of us can't travel much. Even in Australia, we went through a period where you can't travel between states uh, uh, without quarantine. But thank God that's now over. And uh, we're looking at the world trying to open up one by one. But suddenly, parts of the world are now still wrestling with uh, COVID-19 uh, explosion. And some are getting better, some are getting worse. And what do we do in such a time like that? It's still a time of learning and saying, look, what has happened that is new in the past five years? Well, the Lord has continued to show Himself. The Lord has continued to draw us closer to Him. The Lord has continued to cause us to reach out to Him deeper and deeper. Yes, the enemy is busy scattering all those things. But one of the things that uh, Smith Biggers was spoke during the Second World War uh, that he went through, uh, he was in a house, and uh, one of those who were with him, let me try to remember, I think it's a Harvard Carter, uh, who is another great man of God. And he was looking at the papers, looking at the news, and panicking because of all the news uh, as the war was beginning. And, and Smee Wiggerswood was just spending a lot of time with God. He came down and he looked at him and he said, please throw that away. And he, and he said, you know, in the end, uh, and he, he referring to Hitler, he says, uh, in the end, you know, he'll be removed, he'll be dead and gone. And that happened, of course, a couple of years later. So remember that, that no evil can prosper. None of the works of the enemy can prosper. All you have to do, remain faithful, remain in the presence of God, continue to grow in God, establish yourself in the Lord. And as I say, you know, in the past, I is, you know, what new thing has happened? Nothing new under the sun. Everyone's been growing closer to God. Everyone was seeking to walk with God closer. Everyone has seek to uh, grow in the Word, to understand more of His Word, and, and to understand what God is showing in our time like this. And as I say, that this series that we are going through is the Throne Room series. And they are from a series of visions that God gave uh, on, the, on the Throne Room. And a lot of things that are that I have not seen clearly before, suddenly see and understand clearly. And one of those things is about the four living creatures and what was happening in the throne room. And as we start this subject today, let's go to God in prayer and then we continue to flow forth. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, as your word is before us. We grow from glory to glory, grace to grace, faith upon faith. And we continue to grow in faith, in patience, in all the nine fruit of the Spirit. We continue to grow in worship 
to understand the seven degrees of worship, to understand the transformation and all the union that, that take place under the holiness of God is personified in our lives while on the earth. For you are bringing forth a precious bride, a bride without spot or wrinkle or blemish, that the church of Jesus Christ miss. Uh, Mrs. Lamb that will become Mrs. Lamb of the Lamb of God will be purified and will get herself ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. To that end, to that purpose, we continue to preach your word. We continue to prepare our lives in you. We continue, Father, to give ourselves in worship and in praise and to kneel before you to know that there is no other God but our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other Lord but our Lord Jesus Christ whom you have given all things and to sit under His feet. There is no other Spirit but the Holy Spirit of the living God that has come forth through the blood of the Lamb on the day of Pentecost to fill our lives until the end time when we merge with the seven spirits of God. We thank you, Father. We are where you want us to be. We do what you want us to do. We obey you in all that you have commanded us. And we give you all the glory, the worship, and the honor. Thank you, Father God. We bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Now, before I start in this continuation of this series and the sermon, especially the four living creatures, one of the puzzles that have always been in my heart every time I look at God and look at the four living creatures and 24 others, I always say, why four living creatures? I mean, the 24 elders, they are like in humanoid form. <clears throat> but these four living creatures, uh, they have the face of the, of the eagle, the face of the lion, and the face of the calf, and on the other side, face of the man. And I understood that uh, when they are still, it is like four different gears that each of the living creature can change their faces. Uh, and um, it is like um, uh, when, when they are speaking to you, uh, they could like have one single face uh, and then behind is nothing. Although they have eyes all around because they move so fast in different dimensions. And uh, the closest I could have to understanding this was when we saw the, uh, a the, the angel over Korea, which is north and south Korea at the moment. And that angel looks like he was facing the north and facing the south at the same time. But we know that when the angel comes to speak to us, you only see one face. And the reason is because the angel turns so fast that uh, looking to and fro, and it's faster than I can see, but because they pause at different places, uh, different places they look, it looks like they're facing both directions at the same time. The same with these four living creatures, that each of them is like, uh, they can go from the calf, and uh, then they will move uh, uh, towards the, the uh, face of the man, the lion, and the eagle, and then all, all over again, they go backwards and downwards into all the four faces, each of the living creature. And when they worship God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, it is like uh, it takes four dimensions of worship to contain God's presence. It's like they, they move very fast in each dimension and they, they, were, uh, they have like eyes all around them and they were worshipping God simultaneously in all four dimensions at the same time. And I have also always wondered, why four? Uh, like, why not seven? Why not eight? Uh, four. And why choose these living creatures? God could have you know, got the face of the bear or, you know, for those more interesting, maybe a giraffe uh, or a zebra or, uh, let's say, chimpanzee or a yutan. And uh, then uh, what other interesting animals is there? A panda bear, wouldn't that be cute? 
And uh, <clears throat> there are so many living creatures that God had chosen. Why these four? And of course, the face of the man, we understand. But why these four living creatures? I'm interested, before I talk about this subject and go further, we we'll look at the seven dimensions of worship. Last Friday, we looked about the three different degrees of holiness. And um, now, uh, we're looking at the four living creatures. All these are throne room uh, things and phenomena, which I try to describe one by one because they <clears throat> it's easy to download them one time, but it takes time to understand. And so, why the four living creatures? And I'm sure right now in your heart and your life, even though you might not exactly ask the questions, but you're wondering why the four, and perhaps some of you might have your own understanding, your own interpretation, or whatever level of understanding you have for the four living creatures, perhaps you have some uh, understanding. Don't, don't worry even if you got it wrong or imperfect. I'm just interested to know where you are at when it comes to the four living creatures. And of course, I've examined the Bible. There are names that the Bible given to them is Zo Zoar. And uh, the word uh, zoe is the Greek word for life. But here is the word zoa, and, uh, which is the word life, but used in a way in which uh, the vocabulary is not standard. And that's why we call them living from the word zo zoa. They are like living beings. I did ponder whether they were expressions of the life of God from their title of being Zohar, uh, which is uh, the, the word living or full of God's life. And, uh, but they were more than that. And so I would like you to hear what your views are of the four living creatures and why do you think those four animals are chosen, uh, with the exception of the face of the man, uh, the other three animals that are chosen. Uh, what is it to you that you have your understanding of? So please um, unmute your mic and uh, we give you a bit of uh, input in this time. And that's the joy of having a live audience. Praise the Lord. Uh, and so, yes, let me know your comments on the four living creature. What do you think they are these four? Why choose the lion, the calf and the eagle <coughs> of all the birds, you know? And uh, uh, when there's so many other creatures that God could have chosen. Why, why are they there? And you know, nothing is an accident with God. Everything must have a purpose and reason. And I saw the reason. But before I share, let me hear where you are on this. Praise the Lord. Okay, unmute your minds and you can contribute to the discussion. Thank you. Anyone? Comments? <clears throat> Why the four living creatures? What was in your mind? What were you thinking when you see the four living creatures? Do you accept that? Yeah, 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 they're always there. But why? Why, why the four living creatures? <clears throat> Anyone? I know we're all in different time zones, uh, but yeah, you can contribute. Praise the Lord. Okay, we have a tight one I, uh, from Sigun. Uh, I generally find the four living creatures as scary <laughs> and often ignore them. But I feel the various faces depict various attributes of God. Lion stands for strength, that's all I know. Hmm. Good view, good understanding. Hmm. Scary, yes, I believe to a certain extent. Even Kenneth Hagin in, in his book, I Believe in Visions, when he got taken out of the throne room, he saw them. He was going to look at them, and then Jesus told him, don't look at them. Uh, and then he continued talking to Jesus. Pastor, I believe that uh, the face of a man is one of the more obvious ones because uh, mm. it is uh, something that, uh, I mean, the Lord wants a certain representation. 
um, human, the humankind. And uh, the face of an ox is something that um, we have seen in the cherubim. Yes, the cherub. Old Testament, correct. Yeah. So that also could be uh, a certain type of creature that is already uh, known. So the man and the ox uh, face is more known, but why the lion and the mm. girl? Then of course, lion, we know uh, there is a type, uh, typology that uh, was shown in terms of the lion of, of Judah, Jesus being the lion yes. of Judah. And um, eagle has always been associated with the prophetic uh, ministry. So whether, I mean, that, that is a possibility. Mm. Very clever, Colin. Yeah, you got it all from the Bible. I say that's Colin's Bible dictionary for you. <laughs> it's very good. But also, there's one thing I was wondering. Um, there's always the talk about the law and the prophet. So if they say the law and the prophet, the prophet is the eagle. The law, is there something that to typify as the law here? Can lion be the law? Can Doesn't look like, right? Mm, doesn't look like, but good yeah. thinking. Good to stretch your thinking. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you got all the Bible things that are coming. And a part of it, if the spirit of wisdom and truth is upon you, mm. and upon each one of you, part of it, if you actually go to research every verse on lion, every verse on eagle, and, and then, of course, man is man. And every verse on calf or the cherubim, you might have a clue. Paul Nitoba says, I think the creatures are chosen to represent a governmental authority in the kingdom of God. Hmm, interesting. Interesting. Hmm, good contributions. May I hear from anybody else's mind and thinking? Since we have shown four faces, it mm. would be four um, aspects or four um, character, different characteristics. So the characteristics have to be, in fact, even of uh, polar opposites. Um, mm. uh, if not, you don't need to show four different sides. So if to show four different sides, it's got to be... Um, very different, um, diverse type of uh, characteristics. Correct. This observation. Yes. Good observation. Hmm. And I contribute some things even as you bring forth. Um, uh, when, when Colin was talking about polar opposites, like the lion is uh, opposite the calf and the eagle is opposite the face of a man. Uh, Femi says, I used to think they were like a container system for God's presence. But now I see them more Elder Collins' position. Yes, they are all of these things. They are very curious creatures. There is a whole planet full of them. They are not just four living creatures. There is a whole planet full of them. And uh, they can appear as the face of a man and you wouldn't know. Then suddenly they can have the face of, a, of an ox. Uh, or lion or eagle. Hmm. Pastor, the other thing I was wondering is that um, uh, we know that uh, God is always described as uh, love, light, and life. And in yes. these four living creatures, we know that they are living creatures, they are full of life. We know that they are full of light because they have eyes all around, forward, backwards, facing outwards, and facing within. So light is also very obvious. And what is the part that is of love? Because if they are full of light, full of life, they, uh, they must be full of love also like God. So which is this part, I don't see it described, but we know that they are worshippers. So uh, they are full of love for God because of the worship. Is that a, a way to look at the expression of love? Possible also. 
they are four expressions of love. And of course, they are worshippers. Every time you see them in the Bible, they are always singing and praising God. Holy, holy, holy for the Lord God Almighty, or who was, who is, and who is to come. You always see them worshipping. So we can, we can equate uh, worship as the expression of love. So then they, are, they will be full of light, full of life, and full of love. It's yes. expression of God. Yeah, to a certain extent. Of course, for humans, no matter what level dimension we are in, we more or less retain our, our feature as the face of the man. And the Bible, they describe that some men are like lion-like men. You find the word lion-like. And these are the warriors. The Bible is always consistent in its uh, allegory, which means that if an animal represents something, throughout every representation, it will always be there. So the lion has always been a picture of strength. Jesus is known as the Lion of Judah. Uh, one of the pet names that God gave Israel is the word Ariel. Ariel is literally the Hebrew word for lion. It's almost like calling them lion. Just like some of us may, may not know, but uh, you might have watched uh, the Disney cartoon, The Lion King, and they call the Lion King Simba. But actually, the word Simba means lion in one of the African uh, languages or dialects. So it's like lion. And uh, uh, so the word Ariel is the Hebrew word for lion. And um, so that was one of the pet names that God gave to Israel in prophetic type. And the lion, uh, of course, the enemy uh, uh, roars about like a lion trying to imitate uh, the Lord's trying. Uh, it's interesting how when people are warrior-like, they call them lion-like. And uh, whether they have big wavy hair and a big head kind of thing, possibly. Uh, and, um, but we know that lion symbolize strength and uh, lion uh, show for kingliness when it says lion of Judah. What was the tribe of Judah's prophecy? That there will always be a king in, as a promise to David's covenant that there will always be a descendant of David as a king. So you have Lion of Judah. So the word lion, the word king, the word strength throughout the Bible is all associated together. The word eagle is always uh, related to life, uh, also to prof prophecy. And the testimony of the Lord is the spirit of uh, prophecy, as in the book of Revelations. And um, the eagle renew its strength. When the Lord talks about renewal of youth, he talks about like an e as he, the e eagle renews itself. Apparently, there's a species of eagle that will uh, go into changing all its feathers. It goes into a waiting period. They that wait on, on the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up like eagles. And uh, Cole Stringer, who is an Australian, and he wrote a book uh, uh, about eagles. And um, then on other research about eagles, they talk about how the eagle will go to a period where they will pluck some of the old feathers off and you wait till the new feathers grow. So that is like a picture of renewal, resurrection life and power. So you do have that. And the cherub has always been like a creature of a service. And... Um, it was uh, revealed uh, uh, in the angelic form that there were two cherubs and they were calf-like beings uh, that were there with wings over the place. And so it's like uh, its ability, its strength is always in its uh, shoulders. It can carry huge burdens. Uh, the ox has always been a creature that is used uh, for farming and for 
uh, carrying very heavy loads and also even used for sacrifice. And, um, so that's a picture that we have from the Bible. And as I look into the throne room being partially, you know, some things that are inspired by the Holy Spirit within us, even curiosity. But I was very curious how the four living creatures fit into the new heaven and the new earth. And, uh, and where they stay, how do they stay? Because in New Jerusalem, we can relate to a new creature that Jesus chose, the Lamb, the Lamb of God. So there was a fifth creature, the Lamb. Even though Jesus was referred to, even in Revelations, as a Lion of Judah, Jesus manifests as a Lamb. Jesus manifests as a Lamb. And... Uh, and, and, and the lamb was exalted above all the creatures. And don't forget, the lamb and the lion are also antitheses of balance. The lion and the lamb. As opposed to the lion and the ox. So the lamb was suddenly exalted. And can you imagine... Of all the creatures that God chose, even with prophetic word saying that Jesus is the Lion of Judah, Jesus chose the Lamb, Lamb of God. And remember in the book of Revelation, where Jesus talked about his new name, and you're looking around, what's Jesus' new name? You thought it's some long, exotic, heavenly language name. But it was a simple name. Lamb of God. Jesus' new name. He chose the Lamb. Why the Lamb? Because the Lamb sacrifice, which Jesus gave Himself. Remember the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world? The lamb has to be sacrificed for all the universe to be renewed. The lamb has to be sacrificed for the whole universe, the created universe, fallen and unfallen. That means the pristine. Needs the lamb to bring all of God's creation into a new relationship with God. Thus the lamb became exalted, but all the four living creatures were still there. So when I look, and I was looking at the four living creatures in the vision, because it seems like, you know how uh, this was what the vision was like? There was the ancient of days before the sea of glass and the sea of glass was like the lever and there was another altar uh, at the entrance of the throne and that must be represent a huge like a huge building actually and uh, where there were angels inside it and it must have been like the bronze altar equivalent in moses moses um manifestation manifestation uh, that he drew as a shadow form in the tabernacle of Moses. And then I saw the throne of God like expand. It began to grow and expand. And then within the throne of God was this other place that we call, and like I was drawn into it and I saw this other place inside the throne was what John saw, where Jesus was standing in the midst of the seven lambs. And then that disappeared. Remember, I talked about changing dimensions of the throne. And then it became like the seven spirits and suddenly the throne like grew big and suddenly there was this, this a throne room that was like the one John saw with the seven spirits and then the seven lambs that were around. And then there was, for the first time, you see, 24 elders that were not seen before. Because Daniel, in Daniel 7, didn't see the 24 elders. You have to go into the throne. 
uh, which grew big. It grew big and keep growing bigger and bigger until uh, when it reached a white throne, white throne room, the whole universe disappeared. It's like everything was captured into it. And uh, as I speak, uh, there is uh, one contribution for SARS-CoG and she talked about four living creatures. Uh, she asked why is there a north, south, east, west. Uh, we talk about that later. All eyes, moon, quick, you can see time zone, places, thing connected to transformation, glory of man. Ox, strength, lion, bonus, eager, renew, human, creation of humans, uh, particular face of the man. Okay, interesting. And so there was this throne room and it expanded and I saw the throne. It's like it grew. It's like, every, or rather you could say, all of us look like becoming smaller. And the throne room go. And then you realize, wow, this throne room is that, that huge. And uh, there was, uh, and as the throne room expanded, it looked like there's another throne within the throne. And uh, then this was the throne room that John saw with the 24 elders surrounding and with the four living creatures and with the uh, seven uh, lampstands. And, uh, and that, that is where we, we come in. And then, and as I was looking, it expanded even more. And then the whole universe disappeared. The whole universe disappeared. All you can see is a great white throne. And by the time you see this great white throne, it's like you're looking at eternity. It's like you're looking at the uncreated and all creation disappeared except for life, the life that God created. And all of us are just before the great white throne. And that was after the great white throne. And that's when uh, it expanded and everything disappeared. And then all you see is new heaven, new earth. So that was what the vision was like. It's uh, awesome. And in the, in the midst of that vision, I keep wondering, what's happening to the four living creatures? Uh, and uh, then as I'm looking at this, uh, I don't know, for some reason, I was interested in the four living creatures and seeing what was happening. As I'm looking, that they seemed to also expand, also to contain the worship that was there. And they were all surrounding us. And I keep looking at them. Then suddenly, it's like, you know how I was looking at, uh, at a plane, a certain plane, where I can see all the four living creatures creatures and you can go towards the right or left a bit and can see all the different faces or you can go round on that one plane like what do i mean by plane like for example most of our solar system revolve the, around the sun on a plane that means like they they're all on one plane and they're circulating the sun with a few planets slightly off the plane or like all the planets are revolving like that and then some of the further planets, suddenly they revolve like that. Totally different. But who says you got to revolve around the sun like that? You could revolve around the sun this way, correct. But none of the planets were revolving this way. Most are on a plane, on one plane, revolving around the sun. So the four living creatures were like on one plane. And then suddenly I was taken higher and I saw that there was a plane above and a plane below. And I could see and look at the four living creatures from above instead of from the, play, the side. And then I was also shown that I could look at them and there was God's throne in the center of it and the lamb. And then I saw that I could look below also. They were on one plane, I could look below. And I say, oh, okay, this is mind boggling. And I saw and I tried to describe this plane and I saw like, like God, like the four living creatures, like God is always above them. And then below was God's creation. Because I was asking the question, what are these four living creatures for? And then I saw that these four living creatures, they were not just in charge of praise and worship. It was like the energy that they formed was needed for creation. Of course, Jesus just create like that. 
And you know that the throne room never changed because time stops and time, uh, time doesn't exist there. Except that it was invisible to those who live at different time zones. So now that we live towards the end time, we can see more. Those at the beginning, they can see less because of the limitation of what they can see in their time and what has occurred. So I saw that the Lamb of God was always in the center, but always hidden under the New Testament of this. Then I saw that the Lamb was also the Word, and that all creation has always needed this four living creatures' energy, and for lack of a better word, I call that bouncing into one another, until this energy re reach a certain quanta, and then it's released as creation. And when God wanted to create more things or creative energy, as it expands the created universe, this energy was going on. And then with each release of energy, more creation was happening. It's like a, a factory of creative energy that require four living creatures. Then I say, ah, they are not just there as, as worship. There was this bouncing off of energy with the lamb in the center of it. And, uh, and in the background, I remember something the Lord told me in uh, 2006 when I taken in a series of visions uh, of heaven. And he finally answered that, that wish I had to visit heaven regularly so that I could tell people about heaven and prepare people for heaven. There was this um, understanding that all the plants that are around us are attributes of the spiritual dimension. And you find it in the Bible. Palm trees are righteousness. The vine that Jesus chose. Of all the plants, Jesus chose the vine. And why he chose the vine? Because the grape vine has been cultivated for thousands of years to the extent that very rarely does it reproduce on its own. It's, it, it has lived with humans so long that it is in a, a, a symbiotic relationship with humans and it's humans who cultivate the vine. And a wine that is cultivated, which is the father God, the husband man, can produce even more fruit than a wild vine growing somewhere uh, that came about through the seeds or whatever. So Jesus chose the vine, the grape vine, and the produce of the grape vine, of course, became part of the new covenant because the vine now becomes a covenant relationship with God. We are the children of God. Jesus is a vine. The Father is a vine keeper. So each tree was chosen to symbolize some spiritual attribute. The hyssop that was chosen in the Old Testament where they take a branch of the hyssop and they dip in the blood of the lamb and they put on the lintels of their house so that the firstborn will be protected. That hyssop represents faith. Faith. And then the almond and the almond uh, rod of Aaron that was placed and before God's presence and grew into uh, branch and flowers and leaves and fruit. Almond, which is also like uh, around uh, the rope of the high priest, bells, almonds, bells, almonds. Almonds represent the anointing of the Lord. Each tree represent a spiritual attribute. Now, each animal represents a soul attribute. The lion is a symbol of boldness. And uh, the lamb is a symbol of meekness. And yet through meekness, it conquers. Uh, 
there is always opposite. When you come to soul qualities, it always come in pairs. Without the pairing, it become too extreme. Like be not like the horse or the mule. Because you, if you are a horse person and be a soul like a horse, you're always in a hurry and running too fast. Uh, Peter the apostle was like a horse. Uh, a mule is usually its nature is stubborn and very slow, but it's slow and steady, almost like a tortoise. And so some people are like that; they're very slow to move into something, and they miss a lot of opportunities. Uh, but they're steady. Others are like the horse. They always jump into everything and make a lot of mistakes because they go too fast and go to places that God never asked them to go. So there is a balance of both and you're a balanced person. I realize that it's God who created the soul. Although watchman knee does not uh, like the word soul and he treat the soul as an enemy, uh, I would not go as far as that. He wrote a book called hmm, The Release of the Spirit or something where anything from the soul is <laughs> drop off. But because the Bible tells us love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, I believe the soul is supposed to be redeemed and can be used for God. And it was originally created to express spiritual attributes, but it is soul qualities that are needed. You still need that. Like uh, uh, the reason why Jesus chose Peter is because sometimes when the Spirit of God works, you need a man like that who can take initiative, uh, strike where the iron is hot, take the, the correct place and position uh, without uh, lingering. And if you have to choose a weakness between one who has uh, fast and quick and, and take opportunity and between one who is slow and miss all the opportunities, the one who is quick will always be the winner. He might make more mistakes in life. He or she might make more mistakes in life, but they will also have more success. On average, it evens out if they love God and they will more, be more successful. Whereas the one who is fearful and timid, the worst case scenario is like the one talent man who is so afraid of everything, it does not even invest one talent. Because in all investment, there's a risk. So as a result, he lost even what he has. And uh, <clears throat> so that's the extreme of that. So the animals represent soul qualities that are needed as part of the creative process of God. So you have the dove, which is harmless, versus the wiser serpents, harmless as dove. You can see the soul qualities are required. Now this is quite scriptural because when... When Israel or Jacob was describing his children, he used animals to describe them. And he says Benjamin is like a wolf, and Judah like a lion. And then he talks about each one of them. And the tribe of Dan at some point was described, uh, both Moses described them and Jacob described, was described as a serpent. At some point, they take on the nature of the serpent. So animals have been used to describe some people. When um, the disciples of Jesus came to talk to Jesus about, uh, I believe it was Herod, King Herod, uh, how he was desirous to see him, Jesus used the words that call him a fox. He was like a fox, a cunning creature, an opportunistic cunning creature. Uh, who pounds when, uh, when there's weakness. And so Jesus described uh, him like a fox. Uh, animals are used to describe sometimes the attributes of a person because uh, they become more like that person. Uh, a mischievous person would be like a, a chimpanzee. Uh, and so... Uh, things like that. Each, each animal has their attributes. And uh, all were made by our God to express certain things. And so when I look at this animal, I, I keep asking God, the Father, I say, 
I know we are one of the four living creatures, the face of the man. And I could not imagine myself having a lion-like face or having a eagle face or, or a, cherub, a, a cherub face. And I said, you know, being made who we are, we're happy with the way God made us. And so when I began to look at this, God began to show that the face of the man has always been chosen to be the priest. That was the first part I saw before I saw the others. I said, why man? And then I realized that man, we were created from the beginning to be the high priest of God. Because we know now that we are the priesthood of Melchizedek led by Jesus. And that each of the other faces were necessary, there's a whole plan of them, in order to bring forth the soul quality. I repeat again. And I say soul quality with the understanding that the soul is working in tandem and in cooperation with the spirit. You need that quality in order to move forward. Uh, and then when I was looking at that, when I, I look at the plane of the four living creatures and they look up and look down to see a whole picture, I realize there's energy bouncing between them. And as the energy bounces between them, then I realize it, it relates to the seven spirits. And then it also relates to what I talked about last Friday, that there was this, uh, I will emphasize the word metamorpho, the word meta. That means the soul had the ability to, to move into different dimensions to work with. And thus, because humans have to exist in the physical dimension, humans needed a larger soul capacity than angels. Angels, they work in the spirit and in the soul dimension. But angels do not have physical body like us. So in order to function in the physical body, you need an enlarged soul which moves in the physical body. And the funny thing, even the enlarged soul needs to be, even enlarged so you can see more details. So God split the soul into male and female. And you know, we could not see all the qualities of the female without the female. We cannot see all the qualities of the male without the male. Only when suddenly angels don't have gender, only when humans were created with gender, where Adam became Adam and Eve, then we see qualities or so that we never see before. It's like God causing us to see all the fine lines that were there when God created. And so the chart that, that is there that was taking place in, in the following creatures, I saw this was a huge light for lack of a better word, a factory of energy of creation. And they continue to exist in that. And so this is the, uh, the uh, if we look at the, pa, uh, the past diagrams first. I like Colin bring the diagrams that we used before, the old diagrams with Moses Tabernacle and uh, seven dimensions of worship. And then there was a last chart that he asked whether I can touch on that a little bit, which I touch on. Can we see the chart for a while? Thank you. Yes. So this is, this one show you the, the, the division of uh, the outer court, the holy place and the most holy place with the seven spirits, seven feasts and all that. And when, when Moses had that, it was only when I saw the throne room that I realized what gave, God gave Moses was like a milestone from the creation to the end of creation. I never realized that until God began to show the throne room and how the throne room revelation flow with that. And so it became like a blueprint of this universe in terms of how God revealed himself. In seven stages, he revealed himself throughout from Alpha to Omega, from beginning to end, he has chosen to reveal himself to us in seven stages. And that is why it's so holy that the Ark of the Covenant, which has been specially touched and embraced by the physical manifested presence of God, is the one piece of furniture 
that get raptured. Isn't that interesting? After the rapture, the ark which Jeremiah hid in the mountains will be unveiled, will be revealed. It is interesting to note that after the Temple of Solomon was destroyed in the Babylonian Empire, just before it was destroyed, Jeremiah the prophet took the ark and hid it in the mountains. And by the time the Babylonian Empire came and tear down all the temple, and you remember how some of the vessels of the temple were hidden, were, were taken, and one of the Babylonian kings uh, uh, one used the holy vessel for his festivity. And that was when God manifest and the finger of God wrote, Mena, Mena, Tekel, Yufasin, because he polluted the holy vessels of God. So God was still watching the vessels that were holy. That means God owns them. And a misuse of them and abuse of them was subject to high penalties of judgment. And so they were judged. And in that very night, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Middle Persian. Uh, and Daniel continued as a minister in that. Now the Ark of the Covenant was preserved and hidden by Jeremiah so that when later they built the King Herod's temple, um, which was more or less like the second temple, uh, it was built, rebuilt and then it was expanded under King Herod. It was known as the second temple. In the Holy of Holies, there was no Ark because no one could build the Ark. No one knew the, where the ark was. The ark, since Jeremiah's time, has been hidden. It was just empty. And um, so they might put some things as symbol or whatever, where the priest would still put his uh, sprinkle seven times there. Seven times always representing the seven spirit. Remember, now that you read the Old Testament, when you see seven times, it always talk about the work of the seven spirits of God. And so... Uh, it was absent, but yet it was recognized by Jesus. And Jesus still go to the temple and still worship God there, even as a child. And he still preached and, and had his last few sermons there too in public. And it was honored by God because it was a temple be unto God. But the ark was absent. And the ark will be absent. Uh, we know where the ark is, a uh, few of us there is. And uh, two of us uh, know where the ark is. Uh, at one time, I was thinking of making a trip there, a secret trip. Then Jeremiah and the angel says, don't go. I said, okay, fine. And so we never went. I just wanted to pay my respects. And, um, and um, uh, we know that after the rapture, uh, the ark will be unveiled. And then all worship was centered around the ark. The ark will be in a place where all the 144,000 can gather and where Enoch and Elijah can gather. And the Antichrist cannot come near. Actually, because of the ark. And uh, so, you have that piece of ark. And I saw that during, uh, when was it? In the mid-tribulation, in the mid-tribulation, after the 144,000 were taken up, and just before they taken up, Jeremiah will appear. Hmm, interesting, all these figures appear. He will appear and they will have a procession uh, during the, when the two witnesses finish their work. There will be a procession where they take the ark from where it is all the way to Mount Nebo where we were there, where we build an altar to the Lord. And there might be a few more trips to Mount Nebo during the next uh, couple uh, decades, I do not know. We just flow with the Lord. But we've done all that needs to be done. And so the ark will be taken and it will be there and the rapture will take place from there. The mid-tribulation rapture is centered around that place. The rapture of the Gentiles was centered around Australia. Mm, interesting to know all these places. There's Mount Moriah that... Um, uh, that, we, that, that Colin read to us the scripture 
And, uh, and that was where Jesus uh, died, speaking his seven last words, which died with the seven spirits of God, which uh, Bin Lan shared. And they, a place is significant. And so the place where we went to in uh, Maraba was significant. And um, Maraba and Mukawe. And then where, where we are in Australia, Australia is special. It's the last place where the Antichrist will take over only after the rapture. While all the other places, he slowly take them one by one during the last three years before the rapture. So we have uh, each significant of each place. Now let's look at the next uh, table here. Uh, the next chart. This was the seven dimensions of worship that I talked about. Already you will notice that a lot of triplets are taking place here. And the glory being the center of all of them. And uh, we've been touching on this chart. And then the next chart is where Colin was asking me about this chart. This is like the male and feminine versions of the seven spirit. You remember there's a male wisdom and female wisdom. You see uh, wisdom and, and it's all along the way bringing forth to the fullness of God. And you see the middle one. <coughs> and um, <coughs> then you see the middle one, the purple line where the seven spirits of God uh, 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 both the male and feminine versions are put together. You see male and female wisdom. You see Christ, the word creator and the Holy Spirit. Uh, a peace where peace squared and love squared is Jesus, the bridegroom, with uh, the church as the bride of Christ. Uh, glory squared, that means male and female one, is right hand of God with left hand of God. And uh, when God reveals his glory. And then uh, you have power squared is the power of being and the power of doing. Then you have life squared, which is the deep purple color one. Masculine life, feminine life as God made male and female. Then um, you have uh, uh, mercy squared, truth and mercy are united in Christ, in God. And it says the two kiss one another. And um, so you can see that all these are interactions within the seven spirits of God. Now, all these things are taking place in the plane of the four living creatures. The four living creatures, north, south, east, west, and uh, the four directions of the four living creatures. In the middle, I saw a lot of energy flowing. Energy flowing. And some energy flow upwards, some flow downwards. The, the upward one is actually from God energy coming downwards. It's like this vision of the energy coming downwards pro, from God, pure energy. And then it's processed here by the four living creatures. And then, um, of course, to the four living creatures, part of the processing further outfield on the plane is the 24 elders. You want to know where the 24 elders are further outfield. I didn't mention them because it, uh, I was concentrating in the middle section. And then with the Lamb of God in the center, and then further down where all things are made by the Word and by the Word and through the Word, after all this processing of the energy, uh, there was creation. And so this, I try, I'm not that good at drawing, but this was as best as I could put it together in a new drawing that I sent to Colleen. Uh, this is the one. Okay. Now I tilted the plane of the four sections in order to show forth, um, to show forth uh, the up and down and, uh, and then right, left, forwards, backwards to show all the whole section. So uh, I, I could not draw it well, but I could draw at least uh, the symbol of the whole thing. And the arrow going up is the worship that goes to God, but the energy actually is coming down from God towards creation. And... Um, you can see uh, in the middle of the, of, the f of the square, you have uh, mercy at the top, God the Father, and then uh, the Lamb or the Word of God, and then you have the Holy Spirit. So you have the Trinity tr involved in all of creation. It's uh, God the Father working through God the Word, 
and then working through the Holy Spirit. So the, the Trinity is at work in all of creation. And it is this four sections that I saw the four living creatures. The first thing I noticed, just to tell you my experience, I could not see the others clearly, but the first thing I noticed was the face of the man. And then the Lord answered the question of why four living creatures from this part first. He showed me that the face of the man represents him as the father and represents the humanoid being. And thus we are closest to God and we could bring forth as the priest. We are the priest to God's creation. We are the revealer of God. Thus, we grew up in families. We understand what the father and the mother and having children are like. We understand these concepts because we're human. Angels do not have families. Angels may know one another, but they don't know what brother and sisters are like. They don't know what father and mother are like. They do not know what having children are like. And the fallen angels try to grab some knowledge of that by coming in to pollute the human race. 200 of them during the time of, uh, of Enoch and Noah where the world has to be destroyed. But they pollute the whole thing. They have no concept. Of what's the purpose of having children and all that? Because they have no love. And they, they do not have the good qualities and if all they're interested is creating, creating, everything is creating, creating. So even when they came into women and produced giants, a lot of the women died and they had to sacrifice their life in order to produce. And there was no concept of fatherhood or that. They could not. In, they were just incapable of bringing it forth because they have never been like us, born a little baby and growing up and understanding all these concepts. But man was chosen for that. We were created for that. And that's why they need male and female to form a family. And uh, then we understand all these concepts. It's, it, it's like a part of our existence. And this is what it's like in the universe of God. It has to be your existence to bring forth the truth of God. The truth of God has to be lived out to know what being a father, mother is, to know what being a son is, to know what being a, uh, a child is, to know what having brothers and sisters are like. It is, it is our human existence that we can understand the truth of God. And that tells you something. The truths of God are so powerful that it cannot be just learned in a classroom. We have to exist in that truth to understand the truth and the full meaning of that truth. So when I saw that, I said, ah, the man is the priest. Then when I look across, then I say, you eagle must be prophet, prophet, priest, and you lion must be king. So then I saw that when, when in the Old Testament there are prophet, priest, and king, it was like God revealing one section. But God revealed the other section when Moses came and he revealed the cherubim, the ox, the mercy seat, with the mercy seat inside. And so the ox was also shown in type. But we never get it together. And by the time we come to the New Testament, <laughs> I saw that the uh, fivefold ministry was also here. So I saw like the apostle had inherited the kingly ministry. And uh, that is why you notice in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5, when the whole church was having all the offering and all that, they brought it to the feet of Peter. This is almost like a kingly anointing. The apostle rules and administrates the church. And uh, then the prophet uh, is on the eager section and still prophet. Then the priest, I realized, was also a teacher. He was an instructor and teacher of God to teach people about God. 
even in uh, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, when they put the teacher last, actually, 1 Corinthians 12 put the teacher number three. It says they were apostle, prophet and teacher because in the church, the teaching rule and the teaching is more important than just evangelizing. And the evangelists will go, go downwards to the, to the next two tiers. Then I saw that the ox or the servant was like the servant. And then I saw the, uh, the four gospels also. Now, the four gospels are interesting. And uh, uh, when you look at the four gospel in terms of the four, uh, four living creatures, you have that Christianity was learning the revelations of God. And as you know, time is always at the side of truth. Which is why when you're under persecution, you don't panic. You just wait on God. It might take months, years, but in the end, when you live in the truth, the truth prevails. And everything dies. Evil always get defeated. It's just a matter of time. Time is always on the side of truth. So truth, no need to justify itself. You just wait on God. God will show forth what is true and what is false. And, but those who are living a lie or, or, or not in truth, always in a hurry, have to do this, have to do that, have to do that, have to do that. always in a panic mode. But truth has peace as a king. And we just have to wait on God. And in the end, truth prevails. And you see this happening even in the four Gospels. You see the understanding of the four Gospels relating to the four living creatures, which you, if you type the word, uh, what is the exact word that is there? Um, theta, tetra morph, T E T R A M O R P H, tetra morph. And uh, I don't know, you can see this clearly. Uh, see the word tetra morph, tetra morph. And um, that in the early days when they saw four gospels, they knew that the four gospels relate to the four living creatures. And I'll make it bigger. And you can find it in Wikipedia when you do a search. And um, so it says here, originally, they were confused who is the face of the man, uh, who is the face of the man, and who is the face of the living creature. Can you see that that's the way they started? Uh, face of the man, face of the ox, face of the lion, face of the eagle. And so I'll be reading this to you. That originally started with Irenaeus about 130 to 202 AD. And Irenaeus thought that uh, Matthew was the face of the man, which is actually not true because Matthew is where the kingdom is mentioned much and is the king, Jesus the king. The lion, he thought it was John's gospel. The calf, he thought it was Luke's gospel. The eagle, he thought it was Mark's gospel. And then they keep changing, changing from 130 AD to different, then Hippocletus changed, thought it was, instead, now the position of man, lion, calf, eagle, one, two, three, four, with the eagle last, man first, lion second, uh, third calf. Hypo, Hypolitus thought it was Mark, Matthew, Luke, John. While Irenaeus was Matthew, John, Luke, Mark. Then, uh, then uh, Victorinus thought it was, these are all early church fathers, thought it was Matthew, John, Luke, Mark. And it took some time before people began to see John as the eagle. That was the clearest. And by Augustine, St. Augustine, around 354 to 430 AD, Augustine thought that um, it was uh, Mark, Matthew, Luke, then John. And it take under our modern time. Some modern preachers like Amy Semper McPherson thought it was Luke, John, Mark, Matthew. Then it was Watchman Nee, one of my favorite authors. Watchman Nee was a very, very careful scholar. 
Before he wrote the book, uh, The Spiritual Man, he researched every word on spirit, every word on soul, every word on soul uh, before he wrote that book. So he was a very careful man when it comes to analyzing the Bible. So watch many put what I in the end agree to, that Luke, that Luke was uh, the face of the man. And you have you have Mark, the uh, Mark uh, that he see here. You have a wits. No, you have uh, Matthew as the face of the lion. Mark the face of the man, the servant, and you have John as the eagle. Then after Wash Many, there's another scholar which in my seminary days we did refer to his book called H. A. Ironside. And he also has the same view as Watchman Nee. Luke was the uh, Luke here uh, was the face of the man. Uh, Mark was the face of the calf or servant, and the lion was Matthew. The eagle was always John. And um, by the time it came to the Scoffy reference Bible, Scoffy Bible it retained the same thing. Luke was the face of the man, Matthew the king, lion, Mark the ox, John the eagle. Witness Lee, who is a follower of Washman, of course, took the same thing. Luke was the face of the, uh, of the man, Matthew the lion, Mark the ox, and John the eagle. That is my view too. And uh, having a look at that, <coughs> uh, let's look at the chart again that the four Gospels were pictured there too. And you would have uh, Matthew, the lion, Luke, uh, the face of the man, and um, a lot of teaching in the book of Luke too. And that's why I put it, the face of the man. The eagle has always been John, and the ox Mark the servant. <clears throat> and so this is more the current thing. It took about nearly 2,000 years for the church to analyze this, to come to this conclusion, which is uh, what I agree to is how the four Gospels symbolize these four faces. And um, then what I saw was Jesus was the center. The lamb, which is a new creature introduced by Jesus. Jesus was a lamb with seven eyes. And he was right in the middle of it. And so when I saw it in these three dimensions, on the plane and the up and down, I saw that they were the energies of the seven spirits working together. So you have a creation and the Holy Spirit, you have the spirit of peace. Now remember, all the seven spirits, like the Trinity, always work together. I said, sometimes you see one more prominent. Like when you see power, of course, the spirit of power, the church of Thyatira, the angel, the church of Thyatira is at work manifesting that power individually. But it always works in tandem with all the seven spirits of God. And I also saw that in these, God always reveals some of his revelations in triplets. And God the Father, God the Lamb or Word, and God the Spirit. So it goes right down. Then there was a triplet of prophet, priest, and king on the right side in my diagram. And uh, because towards the right is where, for example, they face the east. Now, north, south, east, west are also not true direction. In the universe where you got north, south, east, west, it's only on the earth. But they became allegories to talk about where the temple faced towards the east or the four sides. It's a human term. You could use north, south, east, west, or you could use forward, backwards, right, and left. So it's just vocabulary for us, an allegory. So don't get too uh, confused by the word north, south, east, and west. And um, they are just human terms to describe directions. How else going to describe direction? Forward, backwards, rightwards, leftwards, right? So north, south, east, west is a good description. And so you have the triplets. And you have what we call um, the, uh, the whole uh, triplets on the left, which you find uh, the prophet, 
the evangelist and the priest. They function together. Uh, and um, you also have, like, when the prophet uh, function together, in the Old Testament, you don't have the evangelist, you have the servant. The prophets and the servants of the prophets, the servants of the prophets became sons of prophets. And the sons of prophets were sons of prophets, but many of the servants like Eli, Elisha, who is a servant to Elijah, became prophet too. And they always had to work with the counterpart, opposite counterpart is priest. In the Old Testament, the priest and the prophet, they work together. When they can work together, it's very powerful. When they can't and contradict each other, that's a sad thing. And um, now when you look at the whole picture like that, here's a question. Where is the bride? In this picture. Where is the bride? Where is New Jerusalem? The bride, of course, are taken from all of creation and brought forth to be part of the Lamb of God, the bride to the Lamb of God. The bride to whom Jesus said in John 17, these are those you give to me. I do not pray for the world, but I pray for these whom you give to me and those who believe through the word of these whom you give to me. We know that it's harvested from the human species. When Jesus came to live among us, he was part of the human species. So the bride came from that. <clears throat> but one of the most important things that I saw was this that God wants to bring forth some sort of creative thing that we will see only in New Heaven, New Earth. That in this, <clears throat> in this universe, we only have a type of that, which is actual creation. But there was something that God was bringing forth perfectly in New Heaven, New Earth. And for that to take place, the four living creatures must merge with humans. Already, the four living creatures has merged with the angels to a certain extent. The angels flow with them. And um, you have Michael, the archangel, he is on the side of the ox. You have uh, Archangel Raphael. He is on the side of the face of the man. You have Archangel Gabriel. He is on the side of uh, the eagle. And you have Archangel Fanuel. And you find that uh, in the book of Enoch, when they're mentioned, these four are always mentioned together as a group. You have Archangel Fanuel, and he is on the side of the lion. Archangel Fanuel will come and manifest uh, beside me, uh, besides uh, Archangel Raphael, who has been in charge of bringing forth all those things since uh, uh, my days in the Lord, in Revelations and all that. Uh, but Angel Fanor will come when it's time for this message to be brought to kings and presidents and prime ministers and to the, uh, the heads of all churches and to bring to them the message of this end time and says, believe this for the judgment of God is coming forth. And then that's when the Antichrist and the false prophet uh, will be rising forth. In looking at some of the things that are coming forth in the years to come, I saw that the Antichrist being about five years plus uh, is now being brought forth to the European sector where he is being tutored in the best European schools. And some of the people who are there are military leaders and politicians and prime leaders that teach him to a lot of the things of this world. And I saw that a false prophet, uh, which is about 16 years now, 
uh, beginning to join some of the uh, African churches where he will try to rise like a minister of God as one of the fivefold, but quote unquote, he's actually the false prophet. So we are living in interesting times and uh, things are changing in front of us. And I, I feel sometimes very uh, sad uh, in the terms of God grieving in that those who have the message are not realizing that these, these that you're hearing are precious stones. No other people on earth has all this understanding put together. There are good people all over the world and they're seeing glimpses of it, parts and pieces. But they're not putting it together so they cannot see what's actually happening and uh, of what the enemy's plans are on the earth and what the enemy is trying to do. If you think that you've gone through uh, the last persecution and which is the last test, uh, which many did not pass, you must understand that the pressure that the Antichrist is going to put upon the whole world to turn a lot of good people good Christians into the apostate church is going to happen. So you'll be surprised that good people who will suddenly not believe Jesus in the fullness of Jesus. They were compromised on some doctrines of Jesus. And uh, so Jesus is reduced in their eyes because they will become more worldly and be satisfied with an apostate worldly church. And so that's why God has Test us to know that this is the message, this is the word. And if all the nonsense that people are saying, remember this. We spend four hours a day with God. Every day, waiting on God. That's what we are doing, preaching the word, holding on. Nothing new is happening. No sin is happening. No nonsense or dirt or unholiness is happening. We are spending time at the throne of God waiting upon him and the truth shall prevail and in the end those who have eyes to see those who have ears to hear what the spirit is saying will know the truth and know that in the challenging times that we live that god is bringing forth a precious bride of which you are a part of to be like the overcomer and put on white linen let the mind be pure. To the pure, all things are pure. To those who are filthy, everything is filthy. It is important that we treasure this truth and know the time that we live in. 144,000 are being born. Antichrist is now five years plus. False prophet is 16 years plus and now uh, joining to some churches. We are living in perilous times, challenging times. The world has never gone through what the world has gone through in this past uh, one year, in this second period, the seven times seven years. Let's hold on to this truth, to know where we are in God, to walk closely with God. Like I say, whether alone or with a group, whether it be 100, 1,000 or 10,000, we will still walk towards God and in Jesus to be the ones who live closest to God, to be the word made flesh. Because in the end, the truth prevail and God will show up and show the fullness of his glory. So here we are as we look at this and as looking, where is the bride? The bride is in the center. Of that. You see the other little box that I draw, uh, it's in like a brownish, uh, uh, brownish yellowish line. That's like New Jerusalem to be manifested in New Heaven, New Earth. But in this time, the bride is, of course, with the Lamb. And the center of everything is love. Love. And you see that. All the lines have to pass to love because God is love. But you will also see that uh, all the various uh, uh, points of the spirit are there. You notice there's life, 
love and light. Look at the eagle, the lamb and the man. In red letters, I put life, love and light. Because these are all the same facets of the character of God. But on the line with power, glory and love, there is power, honor and glory or joy. That means that they have to work in triplets. Without the triplets, it is not enough. Tell me, how can you receive light without love? How can you receive love without light? You can't. You have to have the triplets working to receive them. They don't like work individually. Like for example, mercy, love and peace. We know that peace the God of peace will crush Satan under our feet. And you see, peace is tied with thanksgiving. If you want Satan crushed under your feet, you must have the spirit of thanksgiving. Be thankful for where you are. Though we may be few in number, be thankful for what you're hearing. Be thankful for where God has brought you to. Be thankful. And you will never fall because Satan will be crushed under your feet. So notice that mercy Love and peace works also in a triplet. But last Friday, I talked about the holiness of God working. And I talked about kataros, which is purity. And notice I draw the arrow curve from simofu, metamorphu, and kataros, the purple wording. Because holiness is from God. And as the holiness comes down to us until it looks pure and beautiful at the Kataros level, it has been processed so that we could link up with it. There is a metamorphu process. Metamorphu works in our soul dimension. So the middle section is where you have the last previous chart, the seven times seven spirit male and female and that's why it's all working to produce everything and by the time it finishes we are conformed to the lamb of god the word of god and the middle section is a meta level using the english meaning of the word meta meta means it transcends the realm of the spirit the realm of the soul and the realm of the body and the energy has to be stepped down, converted and changed. Like for example, uh, sunlight, when it's converted, when it's heat is useful, sunlight is absorbed by the trees and then you, the trees later you burn them for fire and heat. Sunlight can be used in solar cells to directly produce uh, electricity. But uh, the sun's energy by itself, we couldn't use it. We can only use it when it's converted into electricity or when it's absorbed by uh, things like, for example, sometimes people uh, use salt. Salt is an absorber and con a retainer of heat. It absorbs the heat, then the heat on the earth slowly re releases it and it's, it stays warm. Uh, but you want electricity, you need to convert. You need, you need some sophisticated, now we think it's simple solar cell because we understand the principles. But before solar cells were invented, it was sophisticated and it take time. Like the plants, they have a photosynthesis process where they convert sunlight into uh, food. And uh, then the food is absorbed by the plants and then they continue growing cells. In a solar cell, the sunlight is converted into electrons and electrons are stripped from certain elements put together and they begin to travel and when they're connected, they form a flow of electricity which we make use of. Or it, or it can be stored in capacitors that we later use or stored in batteries that we later can reuse the electricity. And that's... Uh, uh, and most, most people uh, see solar energy as that. But do you know one of the most important things about solar energy is not how to capture them, how to store them. It's the storage of solar energy because you cannot use all the energy at one time. 
is a storage of solar energy that is also a technological problem uh, uh, in order to be able to retain as much of it as possible. So battery technology and uh, capacitor technology has to improve. Even solar uh, cells have to be improved because it's capturing probably about 20 to 30%. And they are still trying to get it to capture it more and more. Perhaps one day someone will invent where they can capture 50% or 90% then uh, the solar cells will be so powerful. Uh, today, when you capture 20 odd percent, is already considered very good. So you think about that, that you cannot use the energy directly. The same way we look at this chart, uh, God's energy is in a form that is too powerful for us to use. It has to be mitigated and converted into various, various energies before it can, a creative process can take place. There's a metamorpho process. The metamorpho process is like a technological uh, 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 challenge that some things have to exist in different meta realms in order to uh, bring forth what we need that is usable. And uh, so you have this soul qualities that's important to God. With uh, Jesus the Lamb, and he exalted the position of shepherd. Uh, the word pastor in the New Testament is from the word poe, which means shepherd. And in English, it only occurs once in Ephesians 4, verse 12, but in the Greek, it occurs as often as the word shepherd is used. And in Jesus' teaching, he always he was always an apostle, he was always a prophet. In fact, many people regard him as a prophet uh, among the common folk. And uh, he's always a priest, but not seen clearly as a priest until his resurrection, the priest of Melchizedek. He's always bringing forth the gospel of the kingdom of God. But Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So he has exalted the position of the lamb and the position of a shepherd uh, unto us, which is interesting because you know how all things are there or even in shadow form? When Jesus chose the king that was after his heart, he chose a shepherd boy. And that shepherd boy who is David, who became king, despite his flaws and faults, was the best king Israel had. The best king that Israel had. So here you have that this dimension of the metamorpho or the soul which has to harness all the energy now i realize which was the answer to my question it takes the fullness of the attribute of the lion soul the fullness of the eagle soul and the fullness of the ox soul and the fullness of the man to bring forth the energy to create I never realized that because I did ask God the question, will this setup be permanent? The answer was yes. And God showed me what it was like. Now, even in New Jerusalem, humans were merged with the four living creatures, the four living creatures were merged with us, and also the 24 elders will need the human factor to produce new heaven, new earth energy for something which God has in mind. On this universe, we call this the old universe or the present universe, it is creating things in this side of, of um, dimension. But in the one that is after the great white throne, you have a new earth. God wants us, and remember this, God wants a human to merge with all the four faces of the four living creatures. Even the angels have already merged. Once the top angels have merged, it flows down the line to all the angels. So you need people to merge with these four living creatures and the 24 elders. And it's part of what God wants to do. Whether whoever is called into that area is a willing vessel or not, I pray all be willing. God will always raise up before the rapture 
we will have all the 12 plus times two, 12 plus, and all the four plus of first and second generation already in that position. They will be there. They will be complete because it's a part of God's perfect will. And it is necessary to complete this in this universe. So God and his angels are going forth to prepare people in this area. So when I was looking at this chart, I saw that the Holy Spirit was working, even though we don't know it was an eagle and a man, you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation. The ego was the revelation part. The wisdom was the man part. It is also in line with the spirit of revelation and understanding that is there. Now, that was important to work. Let me, let's look here at the book of Ephesians. Ephesians. And you see the twin working, twin attributes working in Ephesians chapter 1. In Paul's prayer, of course, all seven spirits are mentioned in Isaiah 11, but you have here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, he says he prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of Wisdom and revelation. He did not mention the spirit of power and glory. That's a different. Wisdom and revelation. Because God needs to work in the area of receiving. Revelation is, the eagle side is when there is, a con, there is a receiving of an understanding or something that could not be seen before. Then even when it's received, it needs to be understood. So it's like the spirit of wisdom and understanding, which is mentioned in the book of Isaiah. There are these uh, four sections in the book of Isaiah chapter 11. It says here, the spirit in verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. That's a different pairing that uh, is there. Why the two pair together? It seems that before something is conceived, the whole plane that you see, the eagle, the lion, the man, the ox, and the lamb, is like the plane of revelation and thoughts. It's where the blueprint of creation, it's all the word, is the word forming a frame. And that frame is like a frame of taught to us. But there are different types of thoughts. Because we don't live in a realm of thoughts, which is a section of heaven, we don't understand there are varying types of thoughts. Like for example, an Eskimo, because they live in a land of constant snow, they have probably, I heard, you know, seven to twelve words, if you include some of the other words, for snow, slippery snow, hard snow, soft snow, different types of snow. They have seven to 12 words for snow to describe snow. But for us who live in tropical countries who sometimes haven't even seen snow, we say, wow, snow, we only know one word for snow. So in a realm of thoughts, there are these different vocabulary for thoughts like the seven levels of thought energy that is used for creation. In other words, you know what the seven spirits are? It takes 
seven, seven, uh, what I call, dimensions of energy before creation can flow forth. That all must complete their work before a creative process can take place. And we, in, we on this earth are allowed to experience that. Right now, some of you are exercising faith in something. And it didn't come instantly. But what's happening is changing your imagination side. Now, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about four processes of faith. Look at the book of Hebrews here. And um, And you notice when power is mentioned, glory is always mentioned. You can easily put those two words together. They are those other twins. But uh, look at the book of Hebrews. When he talk about the process of faith, this is the roll call of faith. It began in verse 1 saying, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. Now, do you, do you see the word hypostasis or substance? It's a spiritual substance. A substance that is used to create physical thing and physical manifestation. And verse 3 says, By faith, we understand that the world's plural which means the spiritual world, the natural world, the soul world, all creation, were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now for us, we just say God speak and everything happened. But what you didn't see is what happened before God spoke. Something was full before he spoke. See, the Bible say, in the beginning, there was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now, there is something happening, even though nothing seems to be happening. It was the existence of the Word and God. And then only it goes on to say, all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 2. So there is some sort of energetic things taking place in the spiritual realm before creation bursts forth in the natural. And this that you see in this chart is what is taking place. The bouncing of energy until it's complete, ripe, substance, before it was ready for framing. So that the things which are seen, which is the physical world, are not made of things which are visible. They are made of things that are invisible up there. One day, we're going to have you see this process in fullness. Then he lay out all the men and women of faith. But as he laid them down, he talked about some of this process in verse 13. These all died, not having received the promises, although some of them received some promises in their day, but the general complete promise not received until our time in Christ, but having, number one, seen them from afar, number two, assured of them, number three, embraced them, number four, confess. See the process of faith? You have seen, you have assurance, you have embraced, you have spoke. Why did God make Abraham see for a long time before he changed his name into Abraham? Because he was teaching mankind this process. And then I realized why God required the church to be the epitome personification of faith. Because this process we must understand. Remember, all attributes of God must be understood through experience and living it. It is now when you believe something in faith, and then it takes time to come, that you have experience and understanding of this process. Of course, things can be expedited at times. But we must understand this process of faith. For without faith, it's impossible to please God. And God made all things through faith. 
what I saw was this process that I can qualify in a, in a small way, like a process of faith, but more gigantic, involving the four living creatures. And then one of the things I asked God, I say, God, before we even knew about the four living creatures, when we think they were just some description in heaven, you mean all the four living creatures had a pro this process uh, flowing through them? And the Lord says, yes. He says, what's the eagle? Well, the eagle fly high enough and can see. So God says, the first process of faith is my word given to you. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. The word lets you see something you could not see before and understand something. See, yeah. And then the Lord says, what else do you require? Well, we require uh, uh, yieldedness to the word. And I, all the scriptures start coming, you know, this is the person God loves. He who trembles at my word. Then the Lord say, isn't the ox that you're supposed to serve my word? My word is Lord over your life. You shall serve my word and not mammon, not the world, not things. You shall serve my word. My word must be first in your life. You are a servant of the word. All my men and women of God are servants of my word. My word came to them, they serve my word. So, oh yes, sir. So we must become like servant to the word. The word must take first place in our life. If not, we might lose the word like the seed sown on different type of ground. Then the Lord says, What else do you need when you have my word? I say, Well, boldness. Boldness. Boldness to speak your word. Bonus to say, yes, we believe and no one has believed. Bonus like Noah to say, there will be rain and everybody mock him. Bonus to say, this is the end time move when we are so few and many people who are with us no longer believe. And this is the move of God. And even when we are a small group, because one day we will be by the billions, but even now do we believe the word? You have to be bold as a lion to continue preaching, teaching, knowing the word. And then the Lord says, what else? We have to understand the word. Only those who believe the understanding can survive through. Those who believe and have no understanding, they give up to doubts and unbelief. The place of a teacher. Say, wow, Lord, you are good. And then the Lord says, what else? I say, in the end, we must put you first and love you. In the middle of it, the Lamb of God. Only those who love the Lord, the Lord has prepared for them things which I have not seen, yet heard. I say, wow, that's true. So you notice in green words, I talk about some of this process. The process of reception, and uh, revelation and reception, and then understanding and conception. It must become like a blueprint in our life. Then on the other side is imagination, fabrication, and fabrication and creation before it's ready. And you notice the blue words. There was a place of being to the place of doing on the line between God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And between them, you see the word sit, walk, stand, using the three words from Ephesus. In Ephesians 1 and 2, sit in how many places? In Ephesians 3 and 4, walk in love, walk in the light. And in Ephesians 6, having done all, stand. So there's that process that was going on. And I understood that the state of being is being established in us. What happens when you're seated at a throne? The energy is flowing through you and it's going to be conceived inside each one of us. Do you know that your mind is like a womb before God? God has given us a mind that is having the capacity to conceive and receive is what I call the womb of your mind. And uh, a 
let's look at this a little worse. In First Peter 1, verse 13, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, the reproductive areas of your mind. And the word mind is the word dia noia. And I could not find another word. I wanted to put the word visualization, but it didn't. Because visualization is like you already have something to visualize. So I had to put the word imagination, and actually it's not a good word enough, but I couldn't find. I even looked for in, the, in the dictionary and online and said, is there another word for imagination, synonym? The closest they gave was fabrication, still not good enough. And so remember, we're struggling with human vocabulary to describe some process in the spirit. And you and I know this. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, the equivalent of the word dianoia in the Old Testament is here in the Old Testament yet, Y-E-T-Z-E-R. Sometimes Romanized differently. In the book of Genesis 6, God saw the imagination of their heart. So God saw two things. God saw the wicked things that are being done, and then God saw all the things that are being imagined inside their mind. For two reasons, God destroyed the world. What is already there and what has yet to be born from this? Because when some things are conceived, it is like a reality. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, the word Yetzer is regarded as a thing, as something already in existence. And God told the, uh, Moses, when the first generation went in, God said, I want you to compose a song. Now, this series I taught in the Yetzer series on visualization. God told Moses, I see inside them, that is their Yetzer, that there is something that will twist and turn them several generations up. So I give you a song to let them sing the song, pass on to generations, so perhaps it will change and change, turn them. Because the generation that went in for, with Joshua, not a single one and then went astray. But they didn't do some things fully. Like, they did not uh, remove some of those uh, men and women that they should have. And uh, later down the road, they fell like God predicted because God said, I saw it inside the womb of their mind. And that's why the song was composed. The word Yetza is a creative part. Now, God has made the human race with the capacity to conceive. Even fallen men, you know what we do? Before you start a business, build a building, before you do anything, you must conceive it in your mind and your heart. You have an idea first. And from the idea, you create, you do things based on the idea. Sometimes the idea, you don't have the skills, you know how to bring people with skills. Sometimes the idea that you know is good, you can create something out of nothing. Look at most of the wealth of the world today. 20, 30 years ago, the billionaires that exist today do not exist. Where they are today is because of the ideas that they have, that they create and they became of value and today they are billionaires. Where are the next billionaires going to come? Because nothing lasts forever. The next ideas. Even people who become conquerors and rule empires, they have the idea that they can rule and reign and they gather the men and women under them. We humans were made that way. All things were born from an idea and a conception. And you know what God is doing today in this waiting time? He's giving you visions and dreams and revelations about what is to come. So that you and I, some of us will be part of it. We will be creating things. 
we will be creating realities that many will be benefiting from. But now it's only in your heart and mind. It looks like you got no value. But I tell you, in God, they are the most valuable things. And when you have that, and, and, and when God shows all these things, I say, Lord, this goes back to the days and the teaching and conception, visualization and faith. Yes. What is new? What is new in this process is that there is the understanding of the seven spirits. There's the understanding of the seven dimensions of worship. There's the understanding of the process of metamorphu, simmorphu, and kataros. And if we will get that all correct, we will be able to speed up the time process into our realities. And then the Lord gave me a vision, and the Lord showed. The Lord says, look, and I saw some things in the future. I saw that I was going before a major meeting in a stadium when a lot of people were going to be healed. Then I saw what I had to do. I had to go into a place in the Lord in prayer where I could meditate and see all the things. I had to form a concept clearly in my mind. And I saw worship and I saw the four living creatures energizing the worship. And I saw that I could see in my mind clearly a creative process, creative miracles. In that stadium was a dwarf to be grown. In the stadium were people who had gone through war, who lost their limbs, and they were to grow new legs. And I saw that I had to conceive it clearly and see the energy. And then I saw that once it was complete, when I went forth and spoke the word and get people into a certain realm, new arms grow, new legs grow, a dwarf got healed. I said, wow, we have to do that. Then the Lord showed another thing. He says, you know about transportation and you believe it as I've shown you. I said, yes, Lord. Then the Lord showed me, look at how Adam moved from place to place. And I saw that when Adam went to move from one place to another, he just had to, into, in his mind, think about it, and chum, it was taken. Then I saw that at first, we have to learn the process that if I want to go, let's say, from here to Canada, I would think about that, visualize the place. Then when I'm ready, the energy in my mind, chum, like full the reality, and I was instantly there. The, I went from one frame to another. I said, wow, it's transportation like that. We have to learn. So I saw that all these things were expedited so that where before you believe God and there was a time process, this time when, when we could do it correctly in the presence of all those things, it was like done in an instant. And then I asked the Lord for more confirmation on the four living creatures. And then the Lord showed me. He says, when the enemy wants to do something, which he has not done yet, be, before he can do what he do in the seven years, the enemy also got to go through the same process. And it has to be permission granted. And then when the Lord say, immediately I knew the answer, the four horses. Remember the first thing when the seal was opened in Revelation? In the book of Revelations, so the Lord showed me, I said, Lord, I need confirmation that these four living creatures are what I'm seeing here. They are part of the formation of energy into reality. And then I saw in chapter 6 of Revelations. Now I saw in chapter 6 verse 1, when the Lamb opened one of the seals and the Lord said, observe, why do you think I have the living creature announce those words? God could have used an angel, an archangel, or any being he want, correct? There are no accidents in the Bible. There are no coincidences in the Bible. Everything was planned and purposeful. And the Lord said, 
Why do you think I asked each of the four living creatures to announce? I say, Lord, I don't know the answer last time, but I think I do now. It's because the four are involved in the energetic creation of all realities, not just in worship. He said, ah, so from the first living creature to the fourth, the four horses. And these first four are the four forces released by the enemy with permission for God. Because in Daniel 7, God gave permission. Then only this can give permission. But even when the enemy wants to create something, he needed that. See, the enemy cannot do anything on this earth until he finds a man or a woman to conceive of an idea. They have to go through the same process and they're energized by the fallen angel. We will be energized by the original, the four living creatures. So in this reality I saw, when the first sea was opened, the first living creature announced with a voice like thunder. Now you know why seven thunders, seven spirits. Heaven, earth, north, south, east, west. You know where we heard the seven thunders when the sea opened? North, south, east, west, and heaven and earth. They were the thunderous creative force released by the seven spirits of God. So, in permission form by God, where God allows the enemy to have that, the living creature says, come and see. And there was a white horse. And then the second seal was opened and the second living creature says, come and see. Also like a voice of thunder. Then the third seal and the third living creature says, come and see. The fourth seal and the fourth living creature says, come and see. And the whole earth was changed by four horses. Dominion of the enemy, war, the red horse, famine, the fourth horse, and death, uh, famine, the third horse, the pale horse, and the white horse, the red horse, the pale horse, and the black horse, death. Now, look at this picture that I drew for you. And uh, you can see those four living creatures, the enemy has the opposite of them. He has the opposite. The first horse, as you can see, each of the four living creatures, as they announce, as it spoke forth, it will be there is the face of the lion and then you will notice that although a piece is taken from the earth and the red horse and the opposite of the, the other black one, death will be the eagle because the eagle is the resurrection power. I remember the four horses that God gave me and they're exactly opposite names of that. I never realized they also tie to the four living creatures. I realized that resurrection life was, there you have it, uh, the ego. Glorious dominion, there you have it, the face of the lion and the ox working together. And then you have uh, riches and provision. What does it say wisdom will do? Interesting that wisdom cancels famine. If you're wise, famine will never come to you because you will know your way through everything. And what happened? Riches and abundance and favor comes with wisdom. So Solomon became the richest man on earth. So you have, you have resurrection life, and uh, you have uh, the area of uh, glorious peace, and uh, you have the you know the dominion peace. You have this uh, uh, area of uh, of dominion and authority. You have all these four areas which are opposite the enemy. Once the enemy release 
all four of these area, he recreate the seven years into his own image. These are creative forces that God released, that God seeks to flow through each one of us. And so I finally had the answer, why the four living creatures? And most of the time we see them praising and worshipping the Lord because in a place of praise and worship, God will establish His creative force. Which is why one of the things that we want to do besides planting churches is the praise and worship centers dotting the whole planet, dotting the world. We do it here in Queensland. We do it in Sarawak. Uh, it has to be places that will continue to exist after 2029. Pergamos is one of them. Of course, Canada. And you have uh, parts of uh, Africa, South Africa, and they would dominate different places on the earth in order for God to bring forth something. We need, brethren, to enter even deeper into worship. One of the blessings that I pray that God give you is the ability to spend time with God so that it doesn't feel that long. You no, know, you can enter a place of prayer and worship that you just pass and you just enjoy your soul so much in God. And while there, God gives you revelation and thoughts. And the thoughts that flow to you are like bounds in all directions to gather the energy until it forms a creative force that God can use instantly to create things. Remember, nothing doesn't come from nothing. Nothing comes from the substance. Something on this earth comes from the substance of spiritual things. During these two years, accumulate the abundance of this hypostasis that Hebrews 1 talks about. Fill your heavenly bank with this substance of creative energy. And then when we walk out from this period, we will see instantaneous creation and miracles. There has to be a period of waiting to accumulate that. Moses is 40 years, we are less. Paul in his nine years waiting upon the Lord. Jesus in his 30 years. There has to be accumulation of this energy, this bang into your heavenly bank, heavenly gold, silver, and precious stones that come from you spending time with God. And let the four living creatures in praise and worship and the word of God be meditated through over and over again until they are reaching the point of creative energy. The Lord bless you. Father, we pray that you will release this creative energy. Help your people spend four hours, six hours, eight hours with God from time to time so that they know the heights and the depths and the wonder of what you have given to us. For before this time, you have never allowed anyone to work closely with the four living creatures. Not even in the time of Kenna Hagen. You have waited until the seven thunders is released and then you say, the four living creatures are given permission to work with us in ways they have not done before. Help us not to take this for granted or to take it lightly. But we will take it with all assurance of faith to know what a privilege we have been given. Even though nothing seems to be happening on the earth much and we are but few in number like the Church of Philadelphia, yet there's so much happening in heaven where we gather every day together to fuse with the seven spirits, to merge with the throne room energies, to gather together all the energies available 
into readiness when this move is released in power on earth. Let it be unto us according to your word. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pass it to Colleen. Uh, we have questions and answers for those of you who want to ask questions and answers.